So we'd like to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to be sharing God's word with you this morning and good to see all the faces. And we are thankful once again to the Lord for His uh, word that He's revealing to us daily. We are grateful for the testimony we heard of Brother Stephen and thankful to God for His safety. And so just remember the saints in prayer. We're thankful for many other testimonies. We like to continue to pray for Brother Mohan from Newcastle for his continued um, progress and also for our Brother Martin and family, I think, uh, oh, and his wife who are traveling to Richards Bay and uh, also Brother Eric DeBrain's son. We'd like to remember him in prayer as well. So um, uh, Brother Nathan and his wife will be expecting their uh, little ones soon, so we'd also like to remember them in prayer. It's probably any time soon that they will be uh, receiving this little baby into their lives, so we'd like to also remember them in prayer for their safe delivery. So this morning, the 10th of April, 2022, and like our brother John was praying, there are so many things happening in the world right now which we could discuss and add light on and, uh, you know, just bring the revelation of the Word. But I know we'll get to a lot of those things in the the Book of Revelation uh, series that we're doing on Wednesday. Some of the things would make a lot more sense. Uh, but today we're back into Benefits of the Message on Part 57. And we're on the Mystery of the Rapture, Part 10. Uh, hopefully this will conclude uh, the Rapture, well, conclude... <laughs> my a few sessions on this beautiful thought. I don't know if one person can just ever complete such a wonderful subject, but we're just following the leading of the Lord. Amen. And so um, in this uh, part of the rapture, last week we spoke on the purpose and we showed the types and shadows showing uh, the bride and Christ coming together through the type of Isaac. And uh, so this morning we are going to get into a little bit more of that, but the spiritual part of that, not getting into the type, but understanding what is going on. So, and what the rapture really is about. So for a title, the word and the body becoming one. And we like to take our scripture reading from St. John chapter 14, verse 19 to 20. Everybody knows the scripture and if you're there with me, the Word of God reads like this. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to His precious Word. So, I want you to notice in the Scripture... Christ spoke as if they were living, yet they were not living. Right? He said to them, Because I live, you shall live also. Now you're speaking to living people as if they're dead. And as if you're alive. He's, and, and this was before the crucifixion, before the resurrection. He's saying to them, Because I live, you shall live also. So we're looking at the living and he's speaking as if they're not living, but that he is living. Amen. So he said this long before the crucifixion and resurrection, and he spoke as if he's already living, but we are dead. So we're putting ourselves into that scripture. And what was he talking about then? He was talking about being alive in the word, right? Of course, everybody knows you're, you're alive, your blood is pumping within you, you're eating, you're drinking, you're sleeping. You're going about your daily life, but this is specific. This is saying that as I live, you shall live also. Amen. And that's what this rapture is all about. Because I live, you shall live also. That is a direct statement saying that right there where they were, they were not yet living. Amen. While they were alive as humans, they were not yet living in the word, by the word. And then he says... At that day, now notice Christ said those things and, and linked them together. He said, because I live, you shall live also. And then at that day, you shall know. At that day, this was not talking about the physical resurrection for the millennium. 
This was not talking about after the translation. Amen. He promised that the day that that would happen, or the day that would happen when we are alive in the Word, we would know it. It would be an absolute revelation in us that I am in my Father, you in me, and I in you, and we are one. Glory to God. If you didn't realize this, this is the same existence. This, that day you shall know, I am in my Father, uh, my, uh, uh, I in you, you in me. We are one. If you didn't realize, it's the equivalent. It's the same as, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Glory to God. Amen. Do you see that? He promised that we would know for a certainty at that day. What day? The day that you become alive in the Word. You shall know in that day. What does it mean you shall know? You will have a revelation of what it is that the Word and God were one. They will, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. You shall know what it means to be in the Father, and the Father in me, I in you, you in me. At what day? At the day that you become alive. Amen. Glory to God. So, one with Him, one with the Word, is one with the Father. That's right. To start this off, I want to reaffirm one thing. This is and always has been God's original plan. And it has been hidden from the world. Now, I think of all the subjects I've ever preached, all the subjects I've ever studied, God's purpose is by far the, the most favorite subject I've ever preached. I just love it. When, when, when it goes, it's got to go back to the Logos and look at where we came from and look at the plan of time and see that God's purpose was that He created you and me, that He might be you and me, that we might be Him. And if that was God's great purpose that existed in His mind before time began, what is the problem? Now, why is it that people are not even tying that purpose in to what is going on today? It's not because God wanted to hide it. You know, I've come to understand that we have gotten the wrong idea of many of the mysteries of God. We call them mysteries. We assume that God has been hiding them or sealing them up. But it's because we have been falling further and further away from Him and that His ways become more mysterious. So, keeping things to himself simply means he doesn't change his ways. He is constant. We are the ones who keep changing. And when we keep changing, we are moving further and further away. And that's why God feels so much more mysterious. Amen. It's not like as you get closer to him, then he hides it with something else. And as you get closer, he hides it with something else. He's not. He remained the same. Amen. So, it was and always will be a secret as to how he chose to accomplish his plan because mankind is always moving in the opposite direction that God is. Amen. So I want to um, begin by reading a quote and sharing this quote with you. It's a beautiful uh, quote to give us an introduction of what we're going to speak about today. All right. It's the message, the presence of God, unrecognized, beautiful message, preached in 1964 on the 18th of June. Paragraph 38. He says, One day the disciples asked him, <coughs> Excuse me, why did the scribes say that Elias must first come? Jesus said, He has already come, and you didn't know it. And they understood that it was John the Baptist. Right now, look at that. They understood that it was John the Baptist he was talking about. They linked Elias with John the Baptist. Brilliant. Then Brother Bram says, Those elected apostles still couldn't see who he was. That was Elijah. They, in other words, they couldn't see who Christ was, even though they could tie it up with Elijah. Now, paragraph 39. Now look, you know, the coming of the Lord is going to be a secret coming. Now he's talking about the second coming. He said there will be two in the bed, I'll take one, leave one. That's where the night is, two in the field, I'll take one, leave one. You know there is so many people disappear every day of the face of the earth that nobody can account for. 
One of these days, it might be that people might say, well, you mean the tribulation? The thing is on us now? I thought the church was to go before the tribulation. They don't realize and understand that the rapture could take place and they would know nothing about it. It's the secret going of the church. I cannot repeat this enough to solidify this particular point when trying to understand the rapture. It's a secret. It's a secret going of the church. Amen. And think people, paragraph 41, uh, think people will go right on preaching saying they believe they're getting saved and adding in the church and building churches and going on just like they did in the days of Noah and so forth and not knowing it and the rapture down past. It's already happened and you didn't know it. There is hundreds of people disappear from the earth and people know nothing about where they went to. They can't account for it. Uh, somebody was going somewhere. They never hear from them no more. And that could be the rapture. I tell you friends, just because that we are members of the church or something like that, that doesn't mean too much to us. You better buckle up. Here it is. You better buckle up that armor. You better take that whole word of God and hold on to it. Quit this Hollywood acting around here. It's got right into the church and it's a shame. But Hollywood glows, just makes a bright light and the church today is trying to compare with Hollywood. Christ is not in Hollywood. Christ is in the individual. Hollywood glares while the gospel glows with humility. God ain't in these great fine fancy places and all the stuff that we see. He comes in humility, in form of meekness and gentleness, pass right through. And if you're acquainted with the word, you'll see it. He that has an eye uh, to hear, let him hear what the church saith to the uh, what the spirit saith to the churches. See now today, which was identified. Amen. The Lord bless that for us to really understand what is going on. We can read that quote over and over and see how plain it is to us today. It is a secret. The rapture is a secret. The second coming is a secret. It's such a secret. And the reason is because people are looking for something else. And we know the prophet said this before. The reason people miss what God is doing today is because they're always looking to the past or they're looking to the future. Amen. I wish I could hear you say amen. <laughs> Very soon we'll be in, in fellowship. Is the rapture a secret? What kind of secret? How much of a secret? It is a secret in every sense. Revelation, literal senses, hidden in simplicity, completely hidden from the world and carnal man. Because it's impossible for carnal man to understand or accept uh, the mystery of the rapture. Amen. Let's show you another one. Also, a really beautiful quote here. The rapture message, paragraph 65. He says, But to the church. Now, we've read this quote before, but just to bring it back to our remembrance in the conclusion. The bride, the rapture is a revelation to her. What does that statement tell us? The rapture is going to be revealed to the bride, right? To her. He says, and he repeats, it's revealed to her. That the revelation, the true bride of Christ will be waiting for that revelation of the rapture. Now it is a revelation, for the revelation is faith. You cannot have a revelation without it being faith. Faith is a revelation because it's something that's revealed to you. Faith is a revelation. Faith is something that has been revealed to you like it was to Abraham. That could call anything contrary to what had been revealed to him as though it wasn't so. Now faith, that's what faith is, the revelation of God. The church is built upon the revelation, the whole entire body. Glory to God. So we have established sufficiently through the series that this rapture is a mystery that will only be revealed to the bride. Not the Jews, not Israel, not the church, the bride. The bride is a special part of the church, right? It's part of the message 
meant for the bride. The rapture is a mystery to be revealed to the bride, which means the mystery of the rapture is part of the message to us. Glory to God. You see that, saints. Part of the message meant for the bride only during this capstone day and ministry. Just think about it, saints. The saints in Luther's day, Wesley's day, Irenaeus, had no clue about it. They kept guessing at it, thinking about it, meditating on it. They got little scraps here and there of what it might be. And then it built up stories over time that led people completely astray. But look, it's meant for the capstone day and ministry. It's meant for you. I don't know how many ways to say it differently. For you to realize how privileged we are that God is revealing this revelation to you today. And we'll come to, you know, the most important reason why nobody wants to really accept the truth of the mystery. Amen. So, those in the bride will accept it only by pure faith. The faith, the revelation, the faith that framed the worlds is the faith that you are going to have to receive this revelation. Any other way will be intellectualism and reasoning and that will not work. Amen. Here is another uh, quote from Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Still setting up the platform for the little message that we have today. Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Paragraph 536. This one, of course, you know, preached 28 July. His body will do the works that he promised. Now, who's his body, right? We're going to talk about that in a little while. His body will do the works that he promised, like in Mark 16 and so forth. His body was not held in the grave, but was recognized with him in the resurrection. Do you get it? The congregation says, Amen. Now, you know, you and I reading that, we might think, I don't really get that. His body was not held, but it was recognized with him in the resurrection. Do you get it? Congregation says, Amen. Then the body of his believing children. So he's taking that statement that the body of Jesus 2,000 years ago was recognized with him in the resurrection. Right. Means it came up in the resurrection. It didn't remain dead. It was resurrected. It was changed. Right? So he uses that statement to say, Then the body, capital B, of his believing children will not be held in the grave when he comes, but will be recognized with him. Remember the words? Because I live, you shall live also. Right? When he comes, Because he died for the purpose. He died for the purpose. To resurrect his bride, the body. He's not talking about those people who resurrected 2,000 years ago. Those are Old Testament saints. He died for the purpose to resurrect his bride. Right, the body. Recognized because it is his body, because it's the word, it's so completely yielded from the denomination things to him and his word. See, and it's recognized with him because now... Now, in the prophet's day, right? There it is now. We have the first fruit of our resurrection. By know that we've passed from death unto life. You know, the prophet said this. We have the first fruit of our resurrection. He totally understood what that means. For those who understand the word, that is the messianic sign. That's the second pull. The first fruit of our resurrection. We've seen the signs. That shows that he's appearing had taken place. Then he says, By know that we've passed from death unto life, become prisoners of his, and God proving to us by his personal headship that he is the same yesterday and forever. By doing same things through the church, there he is, he's talking about it. Doing the same things through the church that he did then. Amen. What's that second pull? Look, he brings us to St. John 14. He in me. I in Him, in you, you know, so forth. That's right. Oh, glory to God, saints. I hope you can see it. So, you read it over and over until you understand it. Don't take my word for it, right? It sounds like he's talking about the body of Christ, the church, which will be recognized in the resurrection when He comes. 
So he sounds like he's talking about in the second coming, not the body of Jesus from 2,000 years ago. He's talking about the body of the bride saying it will be recognized in the resurrection. So how do he say? It will be recognized in the same signs that were done then. And he said, we've already seen this happening. We have the first fruits of that. And we'll know. And then he ties in St. John 14, 20 to it saying, I, I in him, in fact, he says, he in me, he doesn't even say in uh, the Father in me, I in the Father. He's saying he in me, as in Christ in me, and I in him, in you. Glory to God. You can see how he's bringing it down, right? And he says, it sounds like, so it, it, it sounds like he's talking about the body of Christ, the church, which will be recognized in the resurrection when Christ comes, in the rapture, right? How? By doing the same works he did. He said that, right? So if at the coming of the Lord, it's a secret, and we immediately fly off into the skies, away into heaven, then when does the body get recognized with the works? If we are the body, if the bride is the body, where is it that we get recognized? Where does the body get recognized in the resurrection? Does it mean that we've got to stick around after we get those, you know, glorified earthly bodies and go around the world doing signs and wonders? That's not a secret, right? The moment you start doing signs and wonders and healing people, no more secret. You can have the biggest denomination the world has ever seen. He said he died to raise his bodies, his bride's body from the dead as Adam had to die for Eve to be manifested. Glory to God. He died for the purpose of resurrecting the bride. Let's go on further as we tie this up. We're going to get to John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Amen. Simple scripture, beautiful wisdom in there. Now, everybody knows, if you read that scripture, well, except the, a corn of wheat fall into the ground, he was talking about his death, he had to go into the ground, and then he brought forth the church. Right? Everybody knows what happened to Christ. But now we're talking about another body. We're talking about the body of the bride. Because he said there's a resurrection for that body. And if there had to be a resurrection, it means that body had to be identified in that death. And then because I live, you shall live also. So we don't have to physically die. That we know. That body. Now people, I want you to concentrate on this. This is very important. Our title is The Word and the Body Becoming One. He said, at that day, when I am in you, you are in me. You will know them. You will know that you are living. Amen. So, the body, that is the church, right? The bride church, not the church of Laodicea. The, the bride had to become the word. Then it had to die. It had to be raised a new body. Amen. You and I were chosen from before the foundation of the world. We were chosen to be the, the body of the bride in this last day. We had to have a spiritual death. We had to have a death to things of the world. We had to hear this word and become alive in this word. You know, the amazing thing is, there was a time we thought we were alive and didn't realize we were, we were dead while we were living. And we needed life. Amen. And that's what the opening of the word had to do. So, here it is, saints. The church, being the body of Christ, had to go under or undergo a body change. Right? You remember that? Completely yielded. That means removed from denominational things, removed from churchianity, removed from traditions and becoming things like the nominal churches. We had to be completely yielded from those things. As Brother Maram said, I'm using his English. We had to be changed from that to the bride. From church to the bride. And that's the problem with what's been going on today. Is that people are trying to revive that old church spirit. 
And that's not going to work. That old church spirit cannot become the Word. It only is the bride that becomes the Word. Glory to God. Let's go to the next one. Christ is the mystery of God revealed, paragraph 537. His body was not held in the grave, recognized with Him in the resurrection. There's that statement again. Recognized with Him in the resurrection. Same as He is now. Listen. Which means this. His word, which He is, right? He is that word. He has begun to be risen. Oh, let that sink in. He is the word. He has begun to be risen. The word that that down through the age of Luther, Wesley, see, has begun to raise up to its power. What that means is the church universal or the church spiritual died. In that those dark ages when they brought in Trinitarian doctrines, all kinds of doctrines of men, that was the death of the church. From there on, the church had to rise in a resurrection. It says there it began to move, then it moved a little bit more. Now it's come up to identification. Watch, now to the life in the body is a vindication. The life in the body. People, uh, you know, when you read this, please stop reading this like a newspaper. Stop reading like, like just any book. When the prophet, your prophet, says, Watch, now to the life in the body is a vindication that the rapture is at hand. What life in the body is he talking about? He's talking about the second pull of his ministry. That's supposed to be a vindication. If you're seeing the messianic sign, the Elijah prophet ministry, if you're seeing the, the, the sign of the Messiah, the same as it was in the days of Abraham, he's saying, you know, it's a vindication of the rapture is at hand. And when you see the headship and the body becoming one, and the fullness of the measure of His manifestation shows that the body is about ready to be received to the headship, nations are breaking, Israel is awakened. He brings in the signs of the times. Amen. People, you have to read... You have to, when you, when you read the message and know the prophet of the hour, you've got to read it so much till you know what he's saying by not saying it straight out. When he said the life is happening now, what is he talking about? Second pull, messianic sign, appearing of the Lord. It's a vindication of the seventh seal opening. It's a vindication that the coming of the Lord is at hand because the appearing has taken place. That's what he means. Whenever he says, you're seeing the same signs now, you know he's talking about himself at that time. And that he's recognized the fold that he had to play in the coming of the Lord. So saints, the word in the church, back in the day, Luther's day, Wesley's day, Pentecost. Are we together, right? The word in that day was not at its fullness, right? It was growing towards maturity. Just as the word was growing in the church spiritually, so also the church bodily was growing. The church bodily was growing. It was, it was evolving. It was changing. It was moving towards becoming better. Just think about the past. When they started with the apostles and they started with great signs and wonders and then they started getting into doctrine to try and understand the scripture. They started preaching. No, we must preach more than just Jesus Christ died and rose again. We must get into the teaching of the word. Then they started reading. And they started educating their preachers. And they started developing Bible schools. And then there were interpretations and misinterpretations. And this interpretation and that one. There was Augustine and Hippo. And Augustine of Hippo. And there was uh, Jerome. And, and there was uh, the different ones of the, the founding fathers of the church. And they began. And, and reading and teaching and reading and teaching. And the more they went and went and went. They started moving away from the original gospel of Christ. And some, you know, uh, churches totally lost track of what the original church really was. And the church died at Nicaea, Rome, when they, when they took on uh, uh, revelations of men and not of God. Right? And then, because they died, they needed a revival. They needed to be able to come back to the original. 
And so the church began to evolve, it began to change, it began to bodily grow towards the original again, and the original faith. However, because the body was maturing, it was not going to be the infant church of Ephesus. Now I want you to understand, everybody thinks you've got to go back to the, uh, the faith of the apostolic fathers. You're going back to the faith. It doesn't mean you have to start with those miracles again. If you need miracles today to believe God's word, it means you are an infant, a baby. Alright? Babies need that kind of show and signs to have faith. But when you come to maturity in the word, you don't need that to be a vindication. Right? So that's what we've got to look at. Just like the new birth started in us many years ago, for some of us, and it, it grows in us, right? We learned last week, so our theophany is growing in heaven <clears throat> in parallel to that growth that's taking place in us. So also, the church was made up of all nations, kindreds, and tongues. They were unworthy to take on the fullness of the word. Just think about that. Luther was unworthy to take on the fullness of the word. Wesley was unworthy to take on the fullness of the word. You know, you compare us to Luther and Wesley. Those men were praying hours a day, preaching hours a day. And you say, you, Brother Alistair, how can you say they're unworthy? How could those men be unworthy? How could those great saints of old did such wonderful things, which we haven't... The, the, maybe the things they did in one week, we would never accomplish in a lifetime. And you're saying they're unworthy? What do you mean by unworthy? Okay, so remember the word worthy in the Bible means a servant. Somebody who is hired. Okay, that's what worthy means. In those days when they say, please may I see your worthy. It means may I, may I see your servant. Please may you give me a worthy. Give me a servant who can help me with something. That's what worthy meant back then. And that's why in the Old English, that understanding, you, you should understand exactly what that means. So, when you're unworthy, it means you are unable to be used for a particular purpose. It's got nothing to do with how good you are, how righteous you are in your day, or how much you can accomplish for that particular thing. But for the purpose of this day, for the purpose that was meant for the rapture, those great saints of God who did great things were not able to be used for the fullness of the word because they were still stuck in certain church traditions. So they were struggling. Remember, they were struggling with the change from law to grace. They were unworthy because they could not receive the fullness of the word. You and I struggling today with our lives, with our finances, with our problems, with our payments, with uh, Hollywood affecting our lives, with our children struggling, with our relationships. Oh, do we even feel worthy when we think of that worthiness of, Lord, I'm not even worthy of you. I'm not even worthy to be in the church. I'm so backslidden every day. How can it be? No, the difference is the purpose of God. We are worthy because we have been chosen and we are at the right time, the right body, Everything has been set so that we can receive the fullness of the word, which is the headstone coming down. They, that church, they were struggling with the change from law to grace. Then they were struggling with the deity of Christ in, in Nicaea, which led them into Trinity. They were struggling with Gentile rituals and traditions. <clears throat> they struggled with death and the afterlife. They struggled with politics after the church joined state. Now, when, you, when I start stating those things, you start realizing, hey, we're not struggling with that. We're not struggling with change from Lord to grace. We're not struggling with deity of Christ. We're not we have been, we've moved out the Gentile rituals and traditions. We're learning to put all that behind us. In fact, we put most of it behind us. We're not struggling with politics and church joining state. If anyone comes up to us and tells us church joined state, well, we'll show them the door straight away, right? No. There had to be a change. These people even struggled in Pentecost. They struggled with their liberty. When the Holy Ghost came in, they struggled to even handle the Holy Ghost responsibility. Right? The, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There had to be a change. There had to be a process by which all things of this world, 
all traditions and doctrines of man would be filtered out. And there, then only would the body be able to become one with the word. Amen and amen. When does the body become one with the word? When all those things are filtered out of the church. Then the church becomes the bride. What is the bride? The bride is a church made ready for a marriage. What is a marriage? A joining of two. Amen. Glory to God. In other words, for the full word, the capstone, the full word, to come to the body, the church, the church had to reflect in the natural what the word is in the spiritual. Are we together? And that is the mystery of the rapture. That's what the mystery of the rapture had to do. You, you want all quotes, you want to prove this and that, go ahead and prove this. And what is absolutely important is the effects of the opening of the seventh seal. What do the seals do for you? You can think about it. You can try and make sense of the quotes and the prophecies and Junior Jackson's dream and this dream and that vision and put this quote with that one and tie this up and you'll keep arguing for a hundred years and more. The most important thing is the effects that happen to the church, literally supernatural things happen to the church, to the people in the message. It got them together. It made them fight together. It made them come up with a whole bunch of nonsense together. It made them break things up together. It made them turn everything inside out, upside down, scrutinize everything. In the meanwhile, we were moving along for the ride and God was changing us. God was just slowly making us recognize that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that doesn't type, that doesn't settle with me, this is what settles with me, this is what's right, I feel this right. The Amen started speaking in our heart. We don't even study all that much, we don't even know as much as those people did, we didn't even do as much work as, it has nothing to do with that. The mystery of the rapture is God changing us from church to bride. For the headstone to come down and take his place. Glory to God. So we can see that. What is the forerunner? What is the Elijah of this day? He was the appearing of the Lord. What is appearing? He was the likeness. That was the second pull. The likeness of the Messiah being made known to us to vindicate something. Right? The appearing of the Lord. The messianic sign. What did it come to do, saints? It came to judge the church and uproot all that should not be in it. That messianic sign, that second pool, gave him the clout, the shock, the strength, the power. Nobody could, you know, the, he, he was preaching, he was preaching against people's dressing, people's music, television, Hollywood, cigarettes, drinking. He was slamming the church as any good Elijah would. And ordinarily, they would have come up to him and said, Listen, we don't want you. We can prove you're wrong. But because of that second pull, they were silent. They couldn't, they couldn't challenge him because they knew what was in their lives. And they knew that presence on him, the messianic sign would discern them so fast, they would have nothing to say. They were afraid. That messianic sign allowed him to knock all those things of the church out, preparing the bride for that change. I tell you, God knows what He was doing, right? Came to judge the church in and uproot all the all that should be in it to display the first fruits of the coming of the body. So, in case you didn't realize, if you looked at the feast of the wave offering, we've had it. We've had a wave offering. We had a loaf that was way before the church. Is that right? According to the wave offering, we've seen the first fruits of the resurrection. We've seen the second fold of the seventh seal being manifested. We saw it take place. We saw him vindicate himself through his prophet, showed us an appearing of himself, and then told us there was a cycle coming which we would be a part of. And because we saw that uh, wave offering, we realized we are the crop that is to come. If the first fruits has been waved, we are the crop. There's no other crop, there's no other church, there's no other denomination. There's nothing else that can be like that, or close to that, or even accept that word. 
there is no other crop but the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ because she has recognized. Notice <clears throat> when the prophet was saying, they came and asked him, why does the scribe say Elias must first come? He said, Elias has come, you didn't realize it. He said, they understood it was John the Baptist, which means they recognized the first fruit. The problem they had was recognizing the crop. He said, they didn't know who he was, even though they recognized that one. But it would take time, and eventually they realized at the mystery of his death, at his threefold plan, at his seventh seal in that first coming, they recognized then who he was and what their part in it was, so that when Acts chapter 2 happened, they stepped into their purpose, they were that new body, ready for it, while everyone else, it was Caiaphas the high priest, all those great men of that time, the great church of that time, they couldn't fit into it, because they were not meant for it. They didn't change over during that period. The mystery of the first coming produced a change in that in those disciples, so that when the Holy Ghost came, they were ready for the change, they were the body that was resurrected, they were the real resurrected saints that were living in that day. And that must repeat again today, saints. We've seen the first fruits of the resurrection in our day. And the re we've seen the first fruits of the resurrection in a man who was living. Amen. So what resurrection are we looking for today? The resurrection of the body of the bride. Amen. To receive the headship again. So we recognize this as the opening of the seventh seal. Once a church existed that accepted the word of the forerunner and was willing to give up all the traditions of the church, forsake all the things of the present world, then it was time for the world to for the word to make himself present. We recognize this as the opening of the seventh seal. That's what the opening of the seventh seal uh, has come to, to fulfill. Him coming down because a body he hath prepared. Amen. He would not come down unless the body was prepared. So the fact that there was a first fruits means it was time for him to descend because a body has been prepared. And it could not happen before. Not in Luther's day, not Wesley, not Pentecost. That accepting and willing church now becomes the bride, signifying that the rapture has begun. I just want to say it right here. Those of you looking at me on the screen, I'm looking at you. I just want to say to you, you all are really crazy people. <laughs> to the world, you're all crazy. You people are nuts. What are you doing looking at this man on the screen, listening to this nonsense for? Why can't you be in a church just like everybody else? Why can't you do what all the other churches do? You people are crazy. That's what they think, right? I mean, they'll, they'll even question you. Aren't you intelligent? Didn't you go to school? Don't you realize what's the problem? Why can't you just conform to other people? You know what? After the service is over, go back, go sit in a quiet place and ask yourself, why you just can't go back to those things. Come up with an answer and share it on the group if you must. If you can figure it out, why? But there is just no way your spirit, your heart can ever sit in any place where you, even if you sit there, your skin will crawl with how uncomfortable you are. If it's bad traditions, you can't, you just feel like you're surrounded, some places it's like you're surrounded by evil. You just feel so unsafe just being there. Then you can even be in <clears throat> some places where they're preaching the message and you look at the behavior, you look at how they're speaking the word, you're seeing so much insincerity, you're seeing things. What is it in you that's doing that? I mean, you and I will be the first ones to admit, Lord, I'm unworthy. Why am I even feeling this way? You're actually in your heart saying, but maybe they're right and I'm wrong. Even that feeling inside, that humility, that saying, but surely they look so sincere, they're doing all this right. I'm even struggling, but something doesn't feel right. Amen. That, that feeling on your skin where your pores begin to stand up and you know, Lord, something is different, something is wrong. I want the word. I want more of you. I want less of me. I want to break down everything. I'm willing to let go all that was of my past, all of my thinking, all of my intellect. That can only happen 
with those who are in the bride of Christ, the bride church that's ready for the capstone. There's no other character that it's going to take. The church is not a denomination, the bride church. It's not a, I want to say this, saints, accepting and willing church, which is the bride, that now that it is here, signifies that the rapture started a long time ago. Because the body is being recognized in the resurrection. Amen. And this church, the bride, is not a denomination. I want to say this very seriously and, and, and soberly. It, the bride church is not even a group of message churches. It's not a denomination. A group of message churches who believe all the same thing and agree together, that's starting to look like a denomination. The bride church is a collection of individuals from the different churches who will recognize the open book. Amen. If people recognize the word, if they have that, that experience that we were talking about just now, they are the bride of Christ. They are part of the mystical body that has been recognized in the resurrection of the seventh seal, of the word, of the second coming of the Lord. If people recognize the word, it's because they are the perfected spiritual body of Christ. Amen. Now here's one of those quotes that really, I tell you, uh, shocks people, but it's beautiful to us. Here it is, paragraph 538, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. See what I mean? He has begun to give life. <laughs> Present tense. 63, He has begun to give life unto His body. He has begun? I mean, wasn't there life coming in at Azusa Street? What do you mean now, Brother Branham? He has begun to give life unto His body? The one that He has redeemed. He'll, look at it. The mediatorial work is done. What is that? Intercession is done. He's bringing his life to body in a vindication for the rapture. There it is. He's bringing his life to the body. What did he say? You, as I live, you shall live also. Because I live, you shall live also. And that day you shall know. Glory to God. It's happening. Mediatorial work is done. He's bringing life to the body in a vindication. So the only reason you are seeing what you are seeing and you are in fellowship with the word beyond what other people are is because life has come in. You have been resurrected. The day that he was speaking about in St. John 14 is happening. It has already started by the opening of the seventh seal. It started with you personally when you recognized that that seventh seal was open. When you recognized the manifestation of the seventh seal, and you identified yourself in that seventh seal, that's when everything just starts opening. Life is coming in. It's resurrecting. Life coming in as He promised He would live, we would live as He lives also. So we would be alive in the Word. Eternal life is setting in, saints. The mediatorial work is done. The days of intercession is over. He has found what he was looking for. A bride church. A body resurrected. When the church still had so much of ignorance in the word, it had to have grace. Is this right? When they were still believing the Trinity, when they were still believing in purgatory, when they were uh, so young that they were only needing signs and wonders and prophecies and so on to keep them going, they needed grace. Grace had to be present. So they could not be harshly judged, right? God looked away from Trinitarian beliefs, from purgatory, from prayers for the dead, from celibacy, from strange baptism rituals, and so much more. God looked away. That's grace. That's mediatorial work. That's intercession for ignorance, right? God looking away to allow the simplest form of the gospel to reach the world through grace. Intercession for ignorance. There is now no more need, need for grace, for pardon, and forgiveness for ignorance. There's forgiveness for all other things, for your sin, for your mistakes. We're not saying there's no forgiveness. For, there's no more intercession for ignorance. Why? Because the book has descended. The fullness of the word has come down. It is that day, right? The 
Whereas God is sealed in with the bride in the capstone age, everything else is sealed out. Glory to God. So the blood of Christ, no, no more uh, uh, um, forgiveness for ignorance. The blood of Christ, there's no more reason for the blood of Christ to veil away unbelief anymore. Through ignorance. This is why with you, when you struggle with something in the Word, you go through trials. When you struggle to accept something in the Word, you go through trials for it because there's no more intercession for ignorance. He's revealing it to you and whatever you accept is going to be the blessing and whatever you struggle with, is going, there's going to be consequences for that. Right? Christ has been found. Christ has found what He has been searching for. We have been found of Him. The, the, the capstone and the body coming together closer and closer. Saints, the harder it gets on the outside. That... Those two dimensions becoming one. The world is going in chaos because of that. Amen. Everything that's happening around you is not a mistake. Because this is coming closer and closer together, everything else is getting shut out. Something is happening on the outside. Now that doesn't mean people can't be saved, but if they want to be saved, it's got to be saved in here. It means that people are no longer going to be saved whilst having ignorance. Right? And saved means healed from unbelief. Saved means healing. Healed from unbelief. So if you're not in the Word, in the open book, you can't be healed from unbelief. You will basically be affected by the effects of unbelief on your life, on the outside, and you will continue in that that behavior until the tribulation sets in, and then it gets even worse. But for there to be salvation, healing from unbelief, you've got to be in this word today. Amen. It's the only healing there is right now. Now, I'll read you some of the quotes just now. So, if they have unbelief, right? The church world, they have unbelief, and the the translation of the bride takes place. Those in the church world will not escape the tribulation. Right? They won't. They'll, They'll go through the great tribulation. Those in the church ages, they received great tribulation in life because of ignorance, right? But they escaped hell through grace. Because grace was present, because there was uh, intercession work for them by the Lord, they could miss the fifth dimension, even though they were, Luther was a Trinitarian, he is now in the sixth dimension. <clears throat> Do you understand? Because grace was present. And because uh, the Lamb was sitting on the throne with the book in His hand, because Luther was a Trinitarian, he smoked a pipe, he drank beer, was a good German, and yet he was able to pass through into the sixth dimension after he died. But during his day, he suffered. For whatever revelation he had, he suffered for it. Right? But when the book has descended, dimensions start changing. Dimensions are only fully changed when the bride leaves for good. But when the book has come down to the bride church, life comes in and is a vindication that the rapture has begun. Glory to God. Amen. I want to show you this quote here from Christ the Mystery, paragraph 552. What did they do? They sold out to reasonings of wisdom and education, like Eve did. Fallen angels did. Wesley was a man of God. But what followed him? Fallen angels got into it. Fallen angels got into Wesley's message. What was the angels? First, they were creative beings of God, but fell for Lucifer's wisdom. Fell for Lucifer's wisdom. And you see what they become? Fallen angels and organizations of men who has went forth to establish truths in the earth before that truth could go on and proclamate and get onto the real revelation of Christ, fallen angels come in and took it over and made denominations out of it. That's the fifth dimension, saints, taking the word of Luther and Wesley and creating denominations out of it. He says, that's the reason the revelation of the seventh seal mystery had to be unfolded. In other words, that's the reason the seven seals had to be broken off the book. Watch that, to release the grip of fallen angels, right? Now you see it, what they left off, if Luther would have went on, it would have been here. 
If Wesley would have went on, if Pentecost would have went on, what they done? Amen. Basically what the prophet is saying, had fallen angels not gotten into it, they would have come up to the place where they would become the body. If they didn't stop and get stuck around a certain thing and become an organized religion, they would have went on and progressed into the perfected body. Right? So there has also been those who denominated and sad to say around the word that Brother Bynum brought. They, were, they fell to fallen angels and missed, they missed the rapture process completely. If you talk to some of these people, no way, no way we're receiving this rapture mystery, the message of the seventh seal, no way. They still don't see they're, they're receiving it the way the Pentecostals did. And if you understand, Luther, Wesley, Pentecost, fallen angels got into it, organized it, and kept it that way, hiding the people so they couldn't progress into the perfected body, how can people in the message go back to what Pentecostals believe? Right? Especially if it's controlled by fallen angels. That is the fifth dimension. Alright, let's bring us to the subject, the Word and the Bride, the most glorious part of the subject. And that's what everything is about. Christ is the mystery of God revealed, paragraph 555. Now there is only one thing can happen. There has to be a message at the end time when there is nothing else can follow it. Glory to God. There has to be a message at the end time when there is nothing else. No other church can follow it. Now the ecumenical world has set up such a regime and there can be no Okay, saints, wake up and smell the roses or the coffee or drink the coffee and smell the roses or smell the coffee and drink the roses, whatever you want to do. There can be no denomination, no nothing else follow it. You're either in it or you're not in it. The fruit is on top of the tree and the light is shining on that predestinated fruit. She is ripening into Christ-like fruit. What is this? This is the body being recognized in the resurrection under the rapture mystery. She, who? The bride. The bride church is ripening. She is right at the top of the tree receiving the full light, coming into Christ-like fruit, bringing forth the same signs and wonders, miracles. No, no mellowness and sweetness and the same spirit that he had in him. Hope you see it. See? Amen. This is a serious thing, saints. It tells us a few things. This word of the open book, the revelation of the seventh seal, the revelation of the rapture, is not a message that people can denominate around. I want you to take this and try it. Go take this message. These things we preached in the last... 10 services. Go and try and denominate around us. <laughs> You'll never be successful. They've tried. I mean, you can, once they started saying this 1963 and some brother first caught a piece of the mystery and said, 63 was the coming. They shut him down so fast. They kicked him out and labeled him a heretic and he was gone. Couldn't even last. No more. Not even fumes were left. They shut him down. The moment they tried to say anything about a son of man revealing the son of man, shut him down, kicked him out, labeled him, he couldn't move. He couldn't even talk. They shut him out from all ministerial association. What? A son of man revealing the son of man? He was trying to say that the brother Benham was more than himself at the time of the opening of the seals? Never. Impossible. You're trying to make a man God. Out. Finished. They just can't denominate around this truth. Try it if you must. It's never going to work. It's only going to be accepted by a handful of people. Believe me, that's the truth. I was sitting once in a, in a minister's meeting and I wasn't even sharing the, the richness of the gospel, but just started sharing the, the folds of the, um, the, the seventh seal with the, the brothers there. And one brother just he wasn't even a pastor. I don't even know what he was even doing there in that meeting. He just shut me down completely and told me, you know, basically you don't know what you're talking about. 
And then he came after the meeting and uh, very condescendingly put his arm around me and said, you know what, we should fellowship on these things. But I just want to tell you, you've been deluded and brainwashed by your father. So he was an older minister and he had something against Brother Steve. And that's why he said this to me. <laughs> At that moment, I just smiled. I realized, Lord, there's no way I'm going to get through to this man. I said, no problem, brother. We're going to fellowship on this. And we spent more time fellowshipping together. But I realized there was no way he was ever going to get into this. Because he had a completely, completely Pentecostal idea of everything. And there was no way I was going to get through to this man. But we fellowship for a while until he left. Right? So that's what I'm telling you. There's, there's absolutely no way you're going to take the ministry of the rapture and denominate it. It's impossible. It's absolutely unpopular, unacceptable and very offensive to all normal, traditional, thinking Christian people. It's offensive. The most offensive part of it is for you to say, you're the body of Christ in this day and you are Him made flesh. That's the part, for some reason, they just don't want to accept that. But that was God's plan from the very beginning. That's what He wanted. That's what John 14, 20 is. At that day you shall know, I am in Him, He is in me, I in you, you in me, we are one. At that day, because I live, you shall live also. Amen. The word revealed in the end time saints, which is Christ revealed, will be a message that no denomination or establishment can follow. Only the bride. Did you hear Brother Mary say that? There is no denomination that can follow. The quote says, there has to be a message at the end time when there is nothing else can follow it. So go back and chew on that. She is the seed fruit on top of the tree, the highest level of holiness and revelation that there has ever been. Glory be to God in the highest. Amen. Let's get to the next one here. This is, seed is not air with the shuck. 1963, uh, sorry, 1965, paragraph 63. Listen to the saints. That's why the rapture is different. And will only be for the royal seed of Abraham. It cannot come by the natural carnal seed of the church. There it is. Right? The rapture. What? The rapture is different. It will only be. It cannot come by the natural carnal seed of the church. See these are all the quotes we never got to before. Right? It will have to be the royal seed of the word of God. Through Abraham the royal seed, that's why the rapture has to be first. Because, remember, we which are alive and remain shall not hinder, prevent those which are asleep. For the trumpet of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them together and meet the Lord in the air. Notice, and again it is written, and the rest of the dead live not for a thousand years. The rest of the dead live not? The dead? But we who were once dead, have been made alive, and because He lives, as He lives, so we now live. Paragraph 64. Therefore, there they will not be heirs together. The church, the shock, will never be heirs. Heirs means inheritors. They will never inherit the rapture with us. You think I'm wrong? There it is, the next statement. They'll not be in the rapture together. There is absolutely a church natural and a church spiritual. A church carnal, a church spiritual. You heard it straight from the prophet's mouth. Here it is. Who are you? Carnal church or spiritual church? The body that ties in with the head is not the carnal church. It is the bride church. The spiritual body. The risen body. The changed body. The caught away body. Amen. That's who we are. The royal seed of Abraham. Saints, the two churches will be so close in the end time. I mean, what can you do? What can you do right now to prove your case when all the miracles, signs and wonders, <clears throat> all the 
praise and worship and all the glory and greatness is happening in the carnal church. What do you have to say for yourself? They're going to... These guys have the billboards. They have the buildings. They have the churches. They have everything. They have the money. They have the means. And you and I are still struggling. There's no way we can run out there and stand there and shout, Hey, we're the, we're the real deal. We're the bride of Christ. Come and look at us. The moment you even try to, they're going to shut you down so fast. Where are the miracles? Where are the signs and wonders? We have already seen it take place. We have already seen the vindication. That's not what we are seeing right now. And that's what's important here in this understanding today. So, you will even have the two churches within the ranks of the message, right? So close in the end time that the naked eye might never even tell them apart. Both may be believing this message. Both may be living the life. But only one can be the bride. (coughs) Excuse me. It will be her who has not one ounce of organized religion in her. It will just be pure love for the word that will make all the difference. And by love, I don't mean the emotional expression. Anyone can fake that. Oh, Lord Jesus, I love you. I love this word so much. It means so much to me. Anybody can fake that. Right? We don't mean the emotion part of love. We mean the uniting of souls with the word. Where it's so part of me. I could separate from anything else. My wife, my children, my life, my everything else. But this word is stuck with me. It's a part of me. It's ingrained inside my soul. This is something I can never get rid of. This is who I am. I'm stuck with this. This is stuck with me. That's love. Amen. Not this fakeness. No, that's not love. Anybody can do that. And fallen angels especially. Like nothing else can satisfy you. You will do anything to be in fellowship with the true word. And they will, you will treasure the word. And it will become the purpose of your life and your willingness to share this. There it is, saints. That's the real love of God coming in, the real capstone. Here's a message. Sign of this time. Beautiful. Sign of this time. I always... You know, when you're trying to understand the seventh seal, you've got to see these messages. Sign of this time, uniting time and sign, appearing, uh, the the end time evangelism. You've got to see these things for what they really are. Paragraph 115. Notice like this, when a baby is born, there's three things that constitute its birth. The first thing in normal birth, you adults listen close now, the young children will never catch it. But let's see the first thing in a normal birth is water, right? The water bursts, then the show of blood, then the birth, which is the life. Now that's the same thing that constitutes the new birth. Water, blood, spirit. Very simple sense. Water baptism, sanctification uh, by the blood, and the Holy Spirit coming in. The elements that came from His body is what makes His body. So we saw this water, blood, and spirit produce the church, right? Um... His body is what makes his, uh, his body. See, the elements that came from His body is what makes His body. It come from His body is the material that, <clears throat> that takes to make His bride. Because Adam had His bride taken from His body. So Christ has His bride taken from the body. And when Christ died, there was three elements that came from His body. Water, blood, and spirit. Justification through believing. Water, Sanctification through the blood and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now this last great step must come into the perfection that the Holy Spirit has to live in. That church is so perfectly, t- it will make the head and the body unite together. Now that's where Pentecost failed, saints. They took that baptism of the Holy Ghost, they took that last step and they denominated around it It's got to come in so perfectly that it will make the headship come down and unite with the body. And that's where the previous church failed. Right? They couldn't go on into what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was really supposed to do. Which was to bring in the ability to hear and understand the mystery truths of the gospel. Right? They got stuck with the signs and wonders. So the new birth is identical to a natural birth. The body begins to grow until maturity 
And then it is time for that body to walk in its own path and take control. So I hope you can see that without me elaborating too much on it. But a, a baby is born, it grows, it, it learns to speak, it learns to walk, it learns to <clears throat> become more mature, it learns mathematics, it learns to read, it learns to run, it learns to play, it learns to jump. And then, but it can't remain that all the time. Can you imagine being a 25 year old who's still talking goo goo gaga and jumping around and playing on a, on, a, on a trampoline and a jungle gym? Can you believe if you're 25 years old and you're sitting there at your parents home and you're swinging around on the trees and swinging on swings and playing on jungle gyms and building blocks with Lego and your parents standing there and when's this guy going to get a job? When's he going to his, get his own life going? You cannot remain that. If you understand that, how can you be complacent? How can you accept the, the nature of an infant church as someone who can receive the book? How can it be? How can you be people who are looking for signs, wonders, miracles, healing, raising the dead, all those things, and you still want the open book? You haven't even come up to a mature place where you are working. You are ready for the gospel to come in and bring that maturity in. You want to be a baby, but you also want the open book. That doesn't tie in. That's just not right. The body has to grow to maturity. The body, it is time for that body to walk its own path. Take control of the life that is inside it. Maturity used to be seen. You know something? Uh, you can actually see what's happening in, in normal life today. It's happening in the church you can see it happening in humanity. You remember your, your parents' stories, your grandparents' stories. In natural men, years ago, you saw great maturity, right? I remember my grandparents telling us they were like 18 and 16 and they started life. They got married, they started having children, they started working for themselves, they left home. And uh, imagine at 18 and 16. Can you imagine taking two teenagers today at 18 and 16 and said, All right, go marry, have children and start your family. <laughs> Impossible. How are we going to do this? We don't have a job. We can't build a house. No, we need you, mommy and daddy. How are we going to go? We need a degree first. We need this first. We need that first. We need insurance. We need... Uh, we, there's no way. The, this lifestyle today that the world has produced is... It makes it impossible for people to be mature earlier on in life. And we've accepted what they've, what they've given us. It used to be that men and women could start a family, build a home. They didn't, our grandparents didn't ask. There was a piece of land there. They found some scrap tin and wood and stuff and built their home. They were not complaining. For some reason, they had a nature in them that, that matured them early. Now... It's impossible. Today we are dependent on everything around us. Satan has made it this way and trapped us by it. So if you look at it in the natural, look at what the church wants, right? We are prisoners to our own country, our own government, our own banks. So, so is a denominational church. And worse, we are prisoners to our own minds. That's preventing us from being mature in the world. But when the head and the body unite there is nothing that holds that body any longer. Glory to God. Praise be to His holy name. Let's read here in Christ is the Mystery of God Revealed, page five, seven, uh, paragraph 578. Now we see the promise being fulfilled. Christ, the true headship, going in. Coming in His bride. Where are we seeing Christ, the headship? We seeing Him in His bride. Doing the same works, there it is, watch that, don't miss that. Doing the same works, that second pull, that he did at the beginning, and making ready and fulfilling his word as he did at first, in John fourteen twelve. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. There's your appearing, we saw it happening in the prophet. We saw that fold taking place. Then the head and the body are becoming one. In works and in sign and in life. Works and sign we have seen, right? What's left is in life. Vindicated by God Himself through His promised word for the last day. He promised this in the last day. Now, 
if you're spiritual, you'll catch it. Then we can see that the marriage supper is at hand. According to him in 1963, the process of the rapture it was revealed to him by the seals being opened. The process had begun. The rapture is on its way. We saw the vindication. The marriage supper is at hand. Not waiting for things to happen. He could see it already happening. He said, if you're spiritual, you'll catch it. Glory to God. So saints, when we see the word and the, uh, the, and the, the bride, the body becoming one, then we know the rapture has begun. This is what we've been saying. The rapture is this process. This secret, mysterious process has been taking place. And now we know the marriage supper is close. So, let's have a straight talk. I like straight talks. Do you really understand why the prophet was sent? Do you really understand now why God allowed his life, the prophet's life, to be recorded more than any other preacher in the history of the church? Even in the present day history, not even John MacArthur, not even uh, Benny Hinn, not even uh, T.B. Joshua, had their messages and their lives recorded like this humble man from Kentucky. Not one. Find me one person. You'll even find the works of Luther, the works of Charles Spurgeon, the works of John Wesley, but you'll never have their lives recorded. You have preaching, you'll have teaching. But in the message preached by the prophet, you have his life recorded. The instances, the things that took place, the things, the very things that people will discredit him for and, and speak against him for. There's never been a man whose life has been recorded like this. I'll say it this way. Not even the Lord Jesus Christ from 2,000 years ago has been recorded like this man. What's up with that? Why? Why did this happen? Just think about it. The Lord Jesus' ministry was only three and a half years. Yes? This you're talking about 1947 till 1965. This man's life has been so put uh, uh, in, 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 in record that you can scrutinize it. And if that's the reason why people can do what they're doing to him is because it's all open. It's all there. Why? Why did God allow this to happen? Do you know why it didn't end in his generation? Why didn't it all end in the 1960s? Why didn't the translation take place in the 1960s? He was there. Everything was done. Why is it still continuing 50 years later? We're 50 years later. More than 50 years. To him, to the prophet... The cloud had to vindicate what he preached. You know what vindicate means? I'm going to say this plainly. The cloud was supernatural proof to the prophet that what he preached in the seals was the truth. Right? He was in Sunset Mountain. He saw the, the light come down. He had the angels speaking to him and so on. That was fine. He still didn't see the cloud. Right? He didn't even know it was. Or what it looked like from the lens of the camera from miles away. And then he preached this message, the seals, and then he started having so many regrets. His friends started leaving him. Doors were being closed. And he only got the vindication 1965 when it said, turn the picture to the right, there's our Lord up there. And from there on it was like fire going forward. Quick, short ministry to the very end. Right? That cloud was a vindication to him. I told you like John said, I saw a sign in the heaven that said, this is him, it's our Lord up there. To us, we're not here to see the cloud and the signs. We were not there. We didn't see the healings. We only read it in the messages. We didn't even witness the eyes of the blind being opened. We didn't witness the cancer being healed. We didn't witness... The, the, the legs being made straight, the limbs growing. We didn't see all the signs of A.A. A. Allen and all those great men. We didn't even see the signs in the prophet's ministry, which means our faith is not in that. We can't. We can't say our faith is in that. We read about it. 
By faith we believe it. But that's not what vindicates His coming to us. Right? Those signs and things were vindications to the people in that day, to Him, to the Prophet Himself. To us, who were not there to see the cloud and the signs, the word of the shout vindicates to us that the record of the signs and the life of the Prophet was true. Amen. That's like Christ, the disciples standing with Christ, and there is Christ, right? And He said to them, What went you out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Right? So, we are not the disciples of John the Baptist. We are not the disciples of the prophet in this day. We are not the, the disciples of the, the forerunner. We are the ones walking with Christ. We are the disciples. And Christ is here with us, revealed to us, and He is telling us, He is vindicating the prophet to us. So that as a reason why we need the prophet vindicated, because we need to see who we are in this. So it's like Christ saying to them, when you look at John the Baptist, what did you see? A reed shaken in the wind? A prophet? No. More than a prophet. There's a second fold of that seven seal. He was more than a prophet. He's talking about John the Baptist. Christ was vindicating John the Baptist to the disciples. And that's you and me. You and me sitting here today, we were not there in those meetings. What vindicates to you all the things that happened in his life? Why should you believe the cloud? Why should you believe all the things? Why should you believe that the, that, that messianic sign was the truth? Why should you believe that uh, when he turned his back in who is this Melchizedek and discerned that person? That was the same as Elohim. Why should you believe that? What makes you believe that? What makes you accept that it's true? You've got no proof. It's the word revealed to you today that makes you agree with what is said. See, the word revealed in you vindicates what was done there. It's, but for him, it was the other way around. It was the signs and wonders vindicating the word. Amen. I hope you see that. So, in closing, let's bring it down to the close. Who are we, right? The To us, we don't see cloud and signs and wonders of, of that day, the word of the shout of the rapture vindicated the record of the signs and life of the prophet that was proof of the headship descending into the body at that time. Who are we? We are the body. Who is the body? The feminine, the female attribute, the feminine portion of the word. Now listen, let's go to the scripture as we close this down. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 to 23. And hath put all things under his feet. Whose feet? Christ. Right? Christ's feet. Put all things under Christ's feet means everything is under his subjection. And gave him. Who? Christ. To be the head over all things. The head over all things to the church. Which is his body? Which is his body? The church is his body. What is His body? The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. That's what the body is meant to be, right? The fullness of Christ. Now, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everyone with me? Pay careful attention. We're bringing this to a close now. Jesus Christ, according to Paul, the Scriptures... He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What does that mean? What is the Godhead? It is the authority of God expressed. Right? The Godhead is the authority. The throne of God expressed. Bodily means in flesh. Jesus Christ, one man standing there, was all that was in God poured into that vessel. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Doing the signs and wonders, teaching the word, uh, stopping the wind and speaking to the seas, calming the seas, he was displaying what? The masculine attribute of God. He was displaying the headship. Jesus was not displaying the feminine. He was not displaying the church. He was not manifesting the church. The, the manifestation of God as the church was a secret inside him. Right? Remember, he was not the one being healed. He was not the one being saved. 
He did not have to go through the trials of having a wife and children and family and working through bills and all those things. He was the masculine. He was the headship. He was the manifestation of the headship. The body, the feminine part of God had not yet been seen. The church was only a form of it in pieces and portions through the ages. But the feminine part of God, the portion of Him that was a mystery hidden in Christ, was not yet seen. It was waiting to be resurrected in the last days so that it could be seen. And what's the feminine portion supposed to do? Is she supposed to go out calming the sea, speaking to the wind? No, that's the masculine. That's the head. That's the Godhead nature. What's she supposed to do? His body, the church, is the fullness of the word expressed in human flesh. She's the fullness of His body that filleth all in all. The body is not meant to be expressing the nature of the head, as in the masculine part, doing signs and wonders, doing that a son of man, being the son of man. The body is not meant to be. So when you have churches in the world today, lusting after signs and wonders, they're trying to be the head. They're not coming in subjection. They're lusting after the power of the masculine. And that's what they're denominating over. The power of the masculine was only brought into the church to give the church justification, sanctification, when they knew very little of the word. But when the fullness of the word is come, what is the nature of the, of the bride church supposed to be? We're not lusting for signs and wonders and prophecies and things that the masculine did. The thing that we're supposed to do is show the one thing the wife is supposed to do. And that is subjection to the word. True subjection. You say, oh no, that's so boring. Subjection, what does that mean? The body was dead, saints, and had to be risen from the dead of unbelief. What is your duty? What is your purpose today by the word? What is your godly purpose by the word? I want you to understand that. What is being manifested in you that is subjecting yourself to the headship is God. It's no less than God. As God calmed the seas, as God spoke to the winds, as He was that in that man, there is no natural carnal man that can be in subjection to the word. It will take God to be the amen to His own word. It will be no less than God. It will be God and God uniting. Headship and body coming together. And like it was in Adam and Eve. Adam was the one who was there. Eve was taken out of his side. There comes, she wasn't Eve. They both were called Adam in the day that they were created. They were both Adam. Amen. I want to close with the scripture. So that you can understand this perfectly. It's so beautiful, saints. Let's go to Colossians. See how much time we have. Alright. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Such a beautiful scripture. And that's where the mystery is revealed. Alright. Colossians 1 18 to 23. He is the head of the body. The church. Who is that? That is Christ. Everyone with us? Let's pay attention. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? Who is that? That is Christ, right? He's the firstborn from the dead. That means the firstborn of the resurrection. That in all things he might have the preeminence. In all things he might have the preeminence. That's headship. We don't want preeminence. We're not the head. We're the body. He must get the preeminence. Let no man therefore. Now, here's what we're bringing to you. Here's what's happening in the church world. He's talking about headship preeminence, right? Look where Paul goes to. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day. That What's he talking about? Let no man judge you in standards, laws, respect of an holy day. That means keeping Easter, Christmas, Sabbath or new moon or of Sabbath days. These are just a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Then he goes on. Let no man beguile you of your reward. 
in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels. What is this voluntary? Again, standards, laws, keeping of rules, that's voluntary humility. That's voluntary religion. That's living by your will. And worshipping of angels, that's human leadership, right? Intruding, because these guys, human leadership, intruding into things which they have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, that means they have no revelation of it. Hath not seen mean they have no revelation of it. Vainly. Vainly shows you there's no humility in it, right? And not holding the head from which all the body by joints, that means not even recognizing the headship from where all the revelation comes. The body by joints, bands having nourishment, ministered, knit together, increased with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why? <laughs> if you be dead to Christ, why? As though living in the world, are you subject? Why? As though living in the world, are you subject? That means, if you're dead, why are you still trying to serve God through, through, through laws and standards? Why? As though living in the world. If you're dead with Christ, why are you living in the world? Why are you following touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men? That's telling you all the standards and laws that you are struggling to keep and you are making such a big deal out of those things, you're going to fail by that. They're all going to perish. Which things have indeed... They do have a show of wisdom, right? In will worship, will worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, that's abstinence, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Saints, he's talking about the head and the body coming together, and he says, if you're alive in Christ, why do you still want to live by standards, laws, and trying to correct yourself? You're focusing on the wrong thing. Being in subjection to traditions and laws and standards, eat not, drink not, handle not, traditions of men, voluntary humility, subjecting yourself to human leadership, that's not a body, that's a church. That's not the bride, that's a church. This way of living is an appearance. It's a likeness of wisdom. In will worship, what is will worship? It means <clears throat> it's only successful by the strength of the individual. That's it. People who can keep standards and you know something, I'll tell you this. I think I was speaking about it in um, in the book of Revelations this week or something. I can't remember where I was saying this, but if if people sort of uh, oh, I think it was a question on on uh, on marriages or something. I was saying this. The people who kind of you know, have the ability to keep all the standards perfectly are usually people who have gotten enough money in life, they've got the, they're comfortable, they're not in debt, they have their car, they have their house, and even if it's smallish, but they, they're living by their means, they've overcome the state of poverty, they're coming to church, they have a fellowship where everyone is friends and they're keeping this. It's so easy to go on for 10, 20, 30, 40 years and everyone marries amongst each other. and But that's got nothing to do with revelation. That's got to do with conditions being perfect for you to keep up your laws and standards. You're staying in your small town, your small city, your small little community, and you can keep... The, everyone's working together. They keep your children in line. You keep their children in line. And you think, oh my goodness, we're such a beautiful church. We're going in the rapture. That's will worship. Just take those children and put them in university in another, in another city and see what happens. Just shift you out of your comfort zone and put you somewhere else and see what happens. If there is no word inside, you will fall. You will break. You will see what your strength is. And your strength you'll realize is not in will worship. You will see the most perfect young girl, the perfect young men get totally broken and destroyed. They may have come from a, a perfect family, a perfect church, and you'll see them destroyed and broken into pieces. Why? Because you're not making the word your strength. 
You're making will worship your strength. And that's a church. That's not the bride. We have got to get out of that place. In fact, if you spend all your time focusing on such traditions, it will lead to corruption. That's what Paul says. Saints, this was Paul's message to the Colossians in the first age. Get away from churchianity. It leads to death and corruption. He says, if you are truly dead with Christ, you should not be living in this manner. Touch not, taste not, handle not. You should not need people behind your back, keeping you. Dick is checking. We heard you do this. We heard you do that. Check you, check you, check you. That's just going to produce death. Right? Let's read this last scripture. This is now his continuation. And he goes into Colossians chapter 3. Right? Let's see what happens if you are risen with Christ. Being risen with Christ is what, saints? The beginning of the rapture. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now we just read Colossians 2, where he spoke about standards, laws, touch not, taste not, handle not, right? He says that's going to bring corruption, it's going to bring death. But if you're risen, if you've been called, seek the things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That means your focus shouldn't be on will worship. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, but when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Praise be to God. If you are risen with Christ, by what? By the shout and the voice. Your spiritual eye should be focused on things which are heavenly. That means the wisdom and righteousness you should seek is not that which is in this life of will worship. Your affections, that is your love and devotion, should be of a much higher level. If you are truly dead, stay dead to the things that men teach. When Christ, the headship, who is the life of the resurrection, shall make Himself visible in our realm, when we recognize His coming, that when He shall be made known, then we shall come to life, resurrected in that life, meant for that body, then we will become visible. We will become visible in this realm. As if we were not visible before. But now we become visible. Why? The bride is becoming visible in you. And we become visible in this realm. Manifesting his life. His nature. His behavior and authority. Then we shall be made known. That's what it says. Right? When Christ who is our life shall appear. Then shall you also appear. With him in glory. Amen. We won't just know who He is, but we'll also know who we really are. In glory. What is in glory? Many people think glory is heaven. In the glories. Glory is not heaven. It's not a place. As it often is described, it is a state of life. Appearing with Him in glory. It is the marriage of two dimensions. It is the head and the body becoming one. It is the marriage of the Lamb. It is the mystery of the rapture. Glory to God. Praise be to His holy name. The last quote as we close, saints. Enticing spirits. Preached 1955. My, I feel like the rapture is just above the church. Oh, this makes me feel so good. All sins are under the blood. And the Holy Spirit likes the word. The word, what the Holy Spirit feeds on. Oh my, it comes down and gets in among the people. Cleanses their sin. What is that? The word comes in. Cleanses their sin. Takes away their sickness. Take their blues away. Now I'm drunk. Just drunk as I can be. Drunk in the spirit. Love pouring out of my heart. No matter what anyone's ever done. It's forgiven. Not the bitterest enemy. It's all over. Anybody that's ever talked or said anything about. Oh I wish it was all gone. All cleansed. Now brother, sister. When you're locked in there. And you're alive in him. We won't have the mentality for pettiness and infantile traditional church behavior. We won't have time for pettiness of who keeps COD better than the other. Who's right or wrong in COD in the church. We won't have time to argue about who, is, who has it right on doctrines. We won't have time for churchianity and traditions of man. 
a transformed bride church will have settled into who she is in Christ and will not bother with what others have to say. Our energies will be focused on things that edify the risen body and things that are of much higher order, things that are of a purpose beyond traditional church. But first, we must have recognized, let's close this rapture series down. We must have first recognized His coming, that is the opening of the seventh seal. We must have received the shout in our hearts. We must have heard the voice of the resurrection that raised us out of the dead, of the traditions of church, the voice that caused us to tear away and leave it all behind. We must have be, we must be living caught away into a marriage of two dimensions. We must be here and not here. We must start seeing a body change. Our taste for church must change from, from church to bride. We must see a body change. Our taste must change, right? We must be transfigured from a virgin church waiting to be a bride to a bride dressed at the altar in true righteousness and ready to be whisked away. And then their translation will come. Fear not, saints. Behold the chariots of God and the horses thereof. It is going home time. It is time now for us to settle in and realize who we are. Put all this what this taste not, do not, handle not, stuff away from you. Get into the love of the word and you won't even have any issues with all those things. We don't care about what people are going to say. He said, my bitterest enemy. I won't even think about it. It's all over because I'm so stuck in there. The word, no matter what they say about me, doesn't make me lose sleep. I don't care what they say. I just wish it was all over right now, he says. It's just, I wish it were done because the word is in. Healing sickness, changing people's lives. That's what we're all about, saints. Fear not, everything is done. The seventh seal has been opened. The process has begun. Even if people don't want to recognize it, there's a change taking place inside of us that's bringing us away, further and further away from all those traditions of church. We have become the risen body. Because He lived, we live also. We've seen what is He lived. The manifestation of the word life made flesh 2,000 years ago. Emmanuel came, became one of us and dwelt among us. So also shall we live. And this is that day when I and the Father, the Father in me, Christ in you, you in Christ, we are one. The headship and the body, the word and the bride becoming one. That is what the rapture is about. That what the rapture was for. The marriage of two dimensions has taken place. We are just waiting for the, for the wedding supper. We're just waiting for you and I just to recognize completely who you are in God. Amen. The mystery of God revealed to you personally. May the Lord bless you. Let's bow our heads, saints. Heavenly Father, once again, glory to your name. We worship you and praise you from the depths of our hearts, Lord. There is none like you. There was never one before you. There is never anything after you. You are God of gods, King of kings, Lord of lords, whoever they may be that may try to claim any greatness, Lord, are all abased, are all put down, because there is no purity in anything that man teaches. There is no truth in what man speaks. Everything in this world around us is full of lies and deception, deceit. There is nothing pure, nothing even close to truth anymore. We can't even trust people around us family members, people in our churches. There's just no trust anywhere anymore, Lord, because there is only truth in you. We are so thankful that you have called us by this great calling, Lord, this great seventh seal being opened in our day that released the truths of the Scripture upon us. We're thankful to be those people brought and raised by that truth. Lord, I pray that this may be a reality to your children. This is not just some fanatic's brought on by a humble man from Kentucky a few years ago. It is not just fanatics. It is not radical life. We are not trying to be anything more than what we are. We are not trying to be anything more like other churches or to try to be some great denomination. We just want to submit our lives to you, to this word. We want to change from will worship, from, from uh, um, forced humility, from those things that Paul was speaking of, Lord, we want to change from that 
to being people who are in subjection to the word from our spirits, from our souls, from our minds, from every single fiber of our beings. That's what we want to be, Lord. There's no other desire in us but to lay our lives down for you, that we might be used for your purpose, O God. Bless us, Lord, this day. Bless all those saints that we spoke about in the beginning, all the, the needs of the assemblies, Durban, Newcastle, wherever they are. Lord, all the needs of your children we committed to you right now. Father, we even do such things right now as I am doing, Lord. Traditions of men in prayer, in, in seeking you in some way. Because we were never taught any other way. But we know, Lord, that deep within ourselves we are communing with omnipotence. We are communing with omnipresence. Lord, we, we know who we are. And even some of these appearances of traditions of church and prayer and worship and singing do not have any effect on us, Lord, because we know the priority. We know the importance. We know the King has come in. Our heads are lifted up. Our gates are wide open. The King of glory has come in. The Lord of lords, and there is none like you, Lord Jesus. May you bless your children today. May this revelation become strong in their hearts forever until the time that we are translated from this dimension into the next. We feel it coming on, Lord, and we know that it is time that your bride come to the position that she's supposed to be. Bless us today, Lord. Bless your children. Bless all those of this congregation. Bless all the able ministers preaching this gospel around the world. Bless all the churches, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, the individuals that are seeking and recognizing the word for this day. Bless them. Bless their families, Lord. Give them strength to overcome the trials that face us in this day. For we need it. We need that strength from the word. We don't want a short way out. We don't want shortcuts and easy ways and to, to relinquish us of our trials. Give us the strength to cope with it. Give us the strength. Show us in your word how to deal with it. And we will face it head on. We promise to do that. For that is what we are chosen to do. No matter how difficult things may be. We will face it head on. Because you have given us the word to do so. Bless us now Lord as we commit all things into your hand. We ask it now in the precious name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our headship. Our bridegroom. Lord it is all you. And none of us. But Lord, we submit to you in all things. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you saints. You can wave goodbye to one another. God bless you till we meet again. Amen and amen.